My name is Corey Hay, and today we're at the International Center of Photography, 1135th Avenue, where Peter Beard is, is going to give the big show. In fact, this is sort of Members' Day, and I was just having some apple cider and a donut, because that's what the members get. I'm a member. You should be a member, too. A lot of exciting things are happening today. Tonight, Peter Beard is opening his big exhibit, The End of the Game. It's a book, a book about elephants, a book about Africa, and we're going to be shooting some of the photographs here. In fact, a little later, we're going to talk to Peter Beard. Over in the corner over there, Mary Hemingway, the widow of Ernest Hemingway, is, is looking at some of the exhibits. I understand this is going to be an Ernest Hemingway booth here a little later. So we're just going to look around at the photographs. Anton is going to shoot them for you, and we're going to talk to Peter and maybe Mary a little later, too. Can I live too? Corey, oh my god, we're on, are we? Well, not really, we're just sort of, we're always on, aren't we? How do you do, Mrs. Hemingway? It's nice to see you. The world's greatest spontaneous interviewer. Mary was a very good friend of the man who's mainly responsible for the whole end of this book, Philip Preston. See, all of this is conversations with Preston. Isn't it? Why don't you take a look at Salvo, he wrote. Yeah? And I want to show you the opening here. You know, I remember Salvo when it was... Bless his heart, what a dear face. I remember Salvo when it was jungle. Of course. I mean, it was great big trees. And this whole book is about Philip Percival and Blixen flying in and opening it up and uh, opening it into this. Wow. And here you have uh, the elephants eating the trees. Here's the, uh, well, of course, that's, yeah. that's a bullet inside of Ahmed's tusk, by the way. But here is the warden inside a tree eaten out by elephants. And here's one of the uh, Wali Ngulus that he arrested. That's Mambua <coughs> Makula, yeah. the most famous of all those places. But the irony of arresting the people that are the one positive aspect of the ecosystem. Yes, yes. But Philip explains it all. Yes. This whole book is actually culminates in his chapter. Roosevelt, all the Roosevelt quotes, yes. and the personal quotes. You were lucky, didn't you? Of course, both of you were lucky. You both went to Africa, I guess, when it was really still Africa, when it was really sort of lots of flora and jungle. And The last time I went was in 62, turn around. But, that's, but it's not by any means the last time. Mary knew Peter, Philip Percival very well, who's Teddy Roosevelt's white hunter. It's a very funny joke. Before I left, very, very, I don't want to use the name, but very, very well-known people here, beautiful, beautiful girls said, you... I've just read in Vogue that Peter Beard is in Africa, or is going to Africa, and you must find him. You must find him and tell him I want to meet him. She I came said, last night. Oh, did you? oh, great. Anyway, I said, you know, Africa is a big country. Uh, the, there are quite a few thousand miles of it. How do you expect me to find one young man in Africa? I went to the New, New Stanley Hotel in Nairobi. Couldn't find the bar. The bar had been switched from where it used to be went to the desk to say, uh, where, what's happened to the bar? And a young man was standing at the far end of the, the registration desk. He said, bar's upstairs, I'll, t I'll buy you a drink. First man I ran into. <laughs> Fate. Using the really funny too. thing is, I didn't even see Mary. I was just kind of <laughs> doing something. I yeah. heard this sort of tragic voice next to me, and I thought, wow, <laughs> that must be thirsty, that one. And so, uh, so the you bought her a first drink, first and I ran into. Yeah, it was yeah. really funny. But those were actually the good days. That was Crazy. the days when I was finishing this book. When were you first in Africa? Of course, you must have gone with your husband into the wild yeah, shooting and, you know. We, we had an actual, the proper, old-fashioned safari. You know, 21 servants. That is, the mosquito nets and, and the, the buggy bath water heated, no ice boxes, no ice, no, you know, none of that sort of thing. Uh, well, the rot, the galloping rot has set in. Yes. By the way, this is in here too. And we, Personal says we used to walk 15, 20 miles a day. Lots, lots and lots of times. Well, it's not like that anymore. I mean, you can't. There are no more great big white hunters, and I mean, it's all. There's nothing to hunt. Isn't that true? Phil Percival was our white hunter. The guy in this book. Do you miss he, that? Do you, would you like to be able to go? Twenty years before, we went in 53 and 54. 
six months. Eight, in fall of 53, spring of 54. But he had gone first in 33, 34. Therefore, he was always in the right places. That's the great thing, I think. It's yeah. so bad. Of course, it was great. Uh, uh, yes. Paris. He really knew. He, he really knew. You're still in the right places, right here at ICP, and you were just in Cuba recently. I know they're going to make a. You want to make a movie about your husband in Cuba, isn't that right? Or you're hoping they'll use Cuba as one of the locations? Yes, yes. They, they. I wrote a book, and MGM bought it, uh, and they. We went down to Cuba just to look for locations. Didn't Castro say maybe you could use the Cuba as one of the sites of the movie? Sure. He assured the MGM people that they. He would give them and his people would give them any assistance possible. Are you disturbed at, say, seeing some of these photographs where you see the whole forest, you know, completely demolished by the sure. elephants? How do you... I'm overpowered, overwhelmed. It just, it seems impossible. You know, that that much devastation could happen in relatively... A flick of the fingers. And the irritating yeah. thing is that we're contributing money to buy helicopters to chase poachers. The yeah. people who used to work for Percival and who hunted with both of us who are actually traditional hunters, they're not poachers, and they're a scapegoat. They're just a scapegoat issue for a destruction uh, that is taking, a widespread destruction that's taking place for which the sort of two-bit politicians who are running the show are responsible. So of course they want to call it. people rather high in the government. Including people rather high in government. <laughs> when you were there in 62, had it changed a great deal since the 50s? Did you see a lot of devastation then? Well, no, because we were hunting we, we, by luck, it happened to be my middle stepson, Patrick Hemingway, was a white hunter. And he took us, my friend was after a lion. I already had a lion, I didn't want a lion. But she was after a lion, and he was able to get opened up a, a large territory just south of the Serengeti in Tanzania. It was, it was Tanganyika in those days. Anyway, we, nobody had, uh, no. Oh, I've forgotten the name of the area. Anyway. Like Tokotok. Well, no, no, like Tokotok's further east. Uh, no, along the southern border of the Serengeti, in Tanzania. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, no one had hunted it for 10 years. So we had the whole place to ourselves. Was there still, was there a moral question then at all about shooting animals, killing tigers, lions, elephants, how? You got a permit for one lion. And uh, what the first, the very first, the second afternoon we were there, we were driving along and he looked up on big rim rock thing and counted, I think it was, nine lionesses, sort of like ladies in a box at the opera. What Corey means is, was there, a, like, was there a moral permit for a lion to kill in his lifetime hundreds of gazelles? No, you're part of a natural system. If you shoot, uh, let's say, a mature trophy-sized animal, actually, you're just stimulating breeding in that herd. You're just... You're well, we just... saw... We, we, she only wanted one. We saw nine, just in a row, like women in a, in a, in a box at the opera, looking out over the field, the, the plains below, you know, at the antelope, whatnot, uh, deciding what they're going to have for supper. Wasn't you, I hope. No, obviously it wasn't you. Can you tell us about your first line? How did you get it? It's too long a story. Anyway, <laughs> were you scared? I mean, uh, no. The the amusing thing about it was that uh, uh, he was standing in a little copse about mm, about twenty yards away when we came upon him, and I was he was supposed to come toward, forward to me, and I was supposed to shoot him in the shoulder. Instead, the coward turned, and I had to shoot him in the behind. But I did got him. Just fine. And of course today I know you're here because your friend Cornell Capper has just been instituted into the Hall of Fame. Robert. 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 Yeah. Brother of Cornell. Oh, personal friends. Sure. He and my husband were together in the Spanish Civil War. I don't mean not for the same organizations, but they, you know, they shared jeeps and that sort of thing. And also in World War II. And the, I, I, Prop and I were in the London Bureau of Time. Bob, I mean, in the London, you know, he worked out of the London Bureau of Time for a long time. So, personal friend. I'm oh, sorry they didn't mention that uh, Kappa was also a very good friend of Picasso's. And, uh, of course, that is actually the proof of what a great photographer he was. He wasn't, it wasn't actually the sort of boring technical quality of his pictures. Oh, no, it, he was the most brilliant darling. He was just a great person. fun fellow. He, uh, he was really... Most amusing. ...in the right directions, you know. It didn't make any difference what the f-stop was. It was just oh. terrific. He, he was pretty good on the f-stop, too. 
goes on. <laughs> they seem to be doing a lot of interesting things here at ICP. If you looked at, you're looking at Peter's exhibit. Have you? I'm not having a chance to look on account of you. But... Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you go. But uh, well, what do you think of the pictures yourself? Just sort of give us your own critique. You can plug your ears. I've been seeing Peter's pictures for a number of years now. I, you know, oh, they're just superb. That's the word for it, I guess. Or what's a better word than superb? <laughs> Come and see for yourself, I guess. Make your own judgment. Thank you. Go on with your tour. And Peter, I hope we'll get to talk to you a little later. That'd and thank you, Mrs. Hemingway, for talking to us. Yeah. Have a good time. Uh, Mrs. Ernest Hemingway and Peter Beard making a tour here at ICP. The end of the game. Peter Beard's latest series of photographs made in Africa. We're going to be talking about it a little later with him. Mrs. Hemingway, obviously sprightly, though white-haired in a sable coat, seems to be having a good time here. America is one of the world's foremost photographers and bon vivants, and also someone who has a very, very serious point of view on Africa. We're going to be talking to him. It's Peter Beard, photographer. In fact, Peter, we just left, I guess, Mary Hemingway, and we were talking to Mary about her last trip to Africa, and she had such wonderful uh, remembrances of it. Philip Percival was her guide there. In fact, Philip, I guess way back in 1909, had been uh, Teddy Roosevelt's guide. He was really one of the great, original great white hunters. And of course, Mary remembered it as a forest. And I guess you sort of remember it the way it is today, which is sort of like a, yeah. a cemetery, a desert. What's happened in Africa? What's, what's the story, Peter? I mean, why have the elephants, you know, torn down all the forests in five years, taken something like uh, Stavo and made it into Starvo, into a complete dustbin? Why has this happened? I mean, when you think of the people in America, people around the world, the different wildlife funds contributing hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars to, to save the animals, why aren't the animals being saved? Well, that's about eight really good questions, and the answers are complex, and uh, they're probably impalatable, but the truth is that it all boils down to population densities. It's not poaching. It's not curio shops, it's not African corruption. It's the human inability to face the truth that populations expand and land does not. So in Africa, where you have this, this, this enormous area where there are reserves, preserves, national parks, whatever you want to call them, you also have expanding human populations. As those populations expand, animals are concentrated into the parks where they're already reproducing at a considerable rate and of course the habitat suffers it suffers on both ends it suffers on the human end where they're cutting down all the forests and it suffers on the animal end particularly elephants where they knock the trees down to eat them and in the case of these elephants they're eating solid wood there i've got a, there's one picture here of a tree that fell over and killed three elephants so it's a joke for the World Wildlife Fund, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to be raising money for helicopters to chase poachers who are actually in many ways helping by limiting these vast densities. It's, uh, it's a very paradoxical, uh, very unpleasant sort of a situation and I'm afraid there are no terribly easy answers. It's, uh, it's almost painful to say we just have to re-educate ourselves and reprogram ourselves and forget our very short-term expedient ideas of life and try and think of something that was a little bit more to the benefit of the future rather than the exact present. Yates said, man has created death. And indeed, of course, we have and we continue to, to create death. I guess, was it 1971 that the great die-off started? Is we go back just five, six years to find out when we started finding out that the elephants were dying. Well, this, this is only one national park, but it's a, a bigger than New Jersey. It's over 8,000 square miles. And the die-off really began when the trees started to go. That was in about 1948. 
then uh, when, the, when the woodland cover got beneath a certain level, it was just a matter of time until a drought caused uh, a situation where the, the fauna, biomass, whatever you want to call it, elephants particularly, needed a good deal of browse to sustain them through the dry period. There were no trees, so they died. They, could, they would have been okay if it had been the rainy season. They could have lived off grass. When you have a drought, the grass grows, and they need those trees. They always have needed those trees. And everybody knew this right from the beginning. It was a conscious decision by all the animal lovers to prevent this area from being interfered with in any way, which is a total hypocrisy because they'd already interfered with it. They'd already placed artificial boundaries around it. They'd already kicked out every single African who'd ever lived off of the animals within the area. Uh, traditional hunting is what poaching really is. It's something that goes through the generations. What you had when Mary Hemingway was first there, when uh, Philip Percival was taking Ernest Hemingway out for the Green Hills of Africa. Philip Percival was... was pop. He was pop in Green Hills of Africa. Um, what you had was a dynamic mosaic over 8,300 square miles where Dense forest was occasionally partly opened up by elephants. Human beings would graze cattle. The elephants would move on. The trees would grow up where they had been, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There were fires. There was open grassland. There was an interrelationship of enormous complexity. There were about 23 different tribes, Giriyama, Walingulu, Wakamba amongst them, all living off the animals in that area. Europeans came in with all their guilt and all their paraphernalia and just simply had to manipulate everything to their own ends. They wanted to save animals, so they just kicked every single African out who'd been part of the ecosystem. They have totally artificial boundaries around a totally, totally artificially manipulated area which they dare to refer to as nature. This is called letting nature take its course. This is allowing the elephants to find their own level. This is in wildlife as it is in Watergate, political lying. It's a lie from the beginning, fundraising in America uh, to save the animals. Everybody wants to save the animals, but they don't want to come down to the realities of, of the actual situation, which is that there are too many animals in too tight areas, restricted by human beings who are exponentially expanding and constantly demanding more and more of what's within those boundaries. And as the, <clears throat> the system in the boundaries is such a failure, as you can see, these, the, these pictures represent a die-off of over 20,000 elephants in one preserve. As it's such a failure within the areas, the expanding human populations have an excellent reason for just taking them over completely. And they will, by the way. So we've destroyed their natural habitat, which is in, in turn destroying them, the animals. And is there a problem of extinction here? Let me just put it this way. We've manipulated their natural habitat and forced them to destroy it. And that destruction will lead to more human takeover. It's almost as if it's... There's a distinct parallel, I think, between the elephants and man. In fact, I think you've said before that elephants and man are very, very close and that uh, the final chapter is this, we're next, limiting our own boundaries. Well, the, uh, this show is to uh, sort of back up the book, The End of the Game, which is essentially about this one area. Um, I sort of forgot what I was going to say there. Oh yeah, the similarity between elephants and man. The epilogue for the book is written by the world's leading ecologist, Richard Laws. He is the only person who's qualified to say this, and he says it very clearly in the last page of the book. The ecology of elephants is more similar to man than any other animal. There's a million reasons why. Amongst them would be their ability to destroy their habitat and adapt to the destruction. Their growth rates, reproductive rates, all their social behavior, everything about them. And that's why in these carcasses you'll notice the human imagery is pretty clear. I mean, there's the mouth and the two eyes of a skull that's kind of shouting out some kind of an empty message. Um, elephants and man are very similar. And I do believe that unless we wake up, and I, I certainly think we ought to, 
but I wouldn't want to bet on whether we're going to or not. If we don't, this will be us. Protect us, protect us. What can we do? Well, if we're not supposed to give money to the World Wildlife Fund. I didn't say that. All right. Well, what are we supposed to do? I would just demand that if I was making a contribution, that I knew what the money was going for. There are too many projects uh, which are just lip service to science and information. What's needed is information and facts. Most wildlife is preserved in ignorance by people who are too anxious to turn themselves into martyrs and heroes, devoting their lives to saving animals. What they're actually doing is taking everybody's time up because they're ignoramuses, they're unqualified, they're mismanaging, and they're killing animals flat out. This game warden, who's considered a great hero, is personally responsible for the death of over 20,000 elephants, of heart disease, stress, starvation, you name it. Luckily, he just had his own heart attack. He stressed out at a very young age. There's a picture of him in the next room, standing inside a tree that was completely eaten out by elephants. You can see he's a very young person. He died of a heart attack this summer because he's a liar. Because he's been, he started the, uh, the buy an elephant a drink program. These elephants need food, not water. That was one lie. The next lie was the, the, the movies made in that area by Robert Holmey. Man can create. He got Holmey to dig a bunch of ditches to irrigate, irrigate a few areas. All they did was to create more and more desert in those areas, because of course the elephants would come in for the odd bit of water and eat everything in the area. They had a density situation. That's what human beings have on this earth right now, where there are 500 million human beings starving to death. As Norman Borlaug says on the back page of the book, if we are to just continue the situation that we have at the moment, where 500 million people, give or take a few, are starving to death, world food production will have to increase in the next 40 years as much as it has in the last 10,000. We're talking about habitat destruction and starvation through density, poaching, corruption, everything else are side issues. There's one issue here, and you won't find a politician in this country willing to discuss it. It's density, because they want those votes. They want that density, and they don't want to tell anything to those numbers that's going to offend them or in, be in any way misconstrued as a personal insult. And they probably figure they won't be around to suffer the consequences. That's right. It's short-term thinking. I mean, uh, look at Tricky Dick Nixon sending that letter to the... Uh, the cardinal, uh, cardinal Spellbound about uh, supporting his views against birth control. A secret letter, remember it was in the front page sure. of the Daily News? Nixon knew perfectly well it was popular to be against birth control. And there, he, therefore, he just wanted the popularity. Well, I think we can say that not only of just uh, Tricky Dick Nixon, but of a lot of current politicians who want to offer us fast answers, just like everyone wants fast food. That's right. Sending food to Bangladesh? I just wish I could go, uh, had the time to go into what a joke it is. More food means more people. If people are dying, it's because they don't have enough food. You give them food, you get more people. The, the ecosystem is crying out for something to return to its normal balance. That In other means words, people and animals just should be allowed to die. I, well, I... Okay, now we're getting into semantics. I would say that nature has a an overall plan which is much larger than our manipulations, our politicians rushing around with food. It, it tries to tell us something if we had the brains to listen. If an area is overpopulated, you start to get disease to thin it out. If that doesn't work, if you have too many missionaries causing the disease, you get starvation. Then you get politicians rushing food over. You get food in there and the reproductive rates continue. In the long term, you get more starvation than you had in the first place. So all I'm trying to say is that human beings are a flick of the fingers in time. They've been here for a handful of years. They've made a mess of the globe in the merest flick of the fingers. Crocodile, that last crocodile book I did, crocodiles are 170 million years old, and we've just eradicated them in seconds. We're newcomers. We're, we're just here in a flash. And look at the damage we've done already, and I can tell you, Tomorrow is practically here, 
and I, I have serious doubts whether if we continue in this way, life is going to be really worth living. I mean, who, who wants to eat soylent green or whatever it was? Remember that movie? So what can we do? Are there any worthwhile, good, constructive programs going on to, to save the elephants, to, to save Africa, or to um, return it to its natural habitat, or return the natural balance of nature? I mean, is anyone doing anything right anywhere? Those are just like words from the past. You see, those days have gone. The, the Ford Foundation that was trying to analyze the facts of this area was kicked out in the mid-60s. That was the time something could have been done. That set conservation back 50 years. Nowadays, I think the only thing you can do is resist. When you see an ad in Time magazine for buy a lion an acre or whatever the latest joke is, just suspect it. <laughs> Ask for the truth behind the bullshit. This is nonsense. This is uh, people hauling uh, all kinds of sentimental charity programs up as sort of I don't know, some kind of bait for our guilt. There are a few programs over there uh, that, that are meaningful. Wildlife Services has always done very good wildlife management consultancy. There are serious people at work. They're largely disregarded because the facts are disregarded and people are scared of the facts, as we were talking earlier. They don't want to know that uh, one is actually going to have to manage an ecosystem that is no longer infinite. The world we live on is finite. The national park that these elephants have destroyed, although it was 8,000 square miles, was very finite, very limited in its, in its boundaries. So is our world. We're gonna have to face that fact. Nobody wants to. It's very unpopular to even say it. Some politician is going to have to uh, sacrifice his temporary craving for popularity and votes by telling us the truth. And I, I don't know when it's going to be, but I hope it's fairly soon. Was this the same area where they were having sort of a, a problem with their census? Some people thought there were 3,000 elephants. They brought the army in. They found out there were 8,500 elephants. And so what do they do? Did they really shoot 5,000 elephants? Well, they were just saved from doing so. What actually happened was the wardens, or the people in, responsible about whom all the sort of nature movies are made, always estimate 300 ele elephants in the area. While they were busy estimating, uh, an army count came up with a figure of 8,500. It was requested because so many trees were, were going. Immediately, the wardens who guessed 3,000 decided to shoot 5,000 because they figured that difference is what would prevent more trees from going. And in fact, I was working for Salvo National Park at that time, and one of my jobs was writing ammunition country, companies to see if uh, immobilizing drugs couldn't be put into the heads of bullets. The whole program was interrupted by the scientists. The Ford Foundation came in and said, look, before we have an arbitrary slaughter, let's just find out what the facts are. How many elephants you got? How, much, how many trees have you got? Let's analyze and define what's going on here, as you would in a business or any other entity. The 5,000 animals that were to be slaughtered, that was postponed. The Ford Foundation came in, the first thing they did was count 40,000 elephants. Five times as many as the army count, 11 times as much as the wardens estimated. Immediately, everybody's hackles were up because this was done professionally, it was done photographically, and it was a vast uh, embarrassment to the uh, established polit uh, politicians and, and the wildlife savers who are next to God. You see, you can't contradict these people who are saving animals. They're, they're holy men. They're never wrong. They're, they seem to be blurred by quite a romantic vision as well. Of, of themselves, themselves, you know. And uh, so people forget that the scientists came in actually saving 5,000 elephants from arbitrary, arbitrary slaughter. Within months, the same scientists were kicked out by jealous local authorities who couldn't stand the program they were, uh, the truth that they were doing. They couldn't stand the truth. So in other words, what we've done is overprotect the elephants to let them overpopulate, which in turn is allowing them to self-destruct, because as they destroy all the trees, and die of constipation. I mean, they're eating hardwood trees, isn't that a fact? I mean, correct. So what's going to happen? Are we going to have a problem of extinct much. elephants, or uh, what's elephants, happening right now? Elephants will definitely be extinct in, in wilderness settings, definitely. No question about it. They already are in Kenya.
I mean, you couldn't even, you, you find baby elephants with uh, two pound tusks ripped out. They're going for everything. The poachers, you're talking about the ivory hunters? Ivory hunters, poachers, it doesn't make any difference what you call them. They're people who are increasing at such frightening mathematical growth rates that every year they're grabbing more and more and more. There's more people to grab and there's more grabbing going on. And wilderness areas have been burnt, leveled, desperate little agricultural setups tried. I mean, you can't grow grow uh, any kind of decent uh, crops in the soil, but they're desperate. They're so desperate, they're trying. The, the, all of Savo is, is in jeopardy. 8,000 square miles, you might as well just throw it away. It's nothing. And, then, and, and the other parks are in line. They're all waiting because they're all mismanaged. Because the people who are responsible don't know what they're doing. They never have. They have kept scientific information out. The person I did the crocodile book was the first scientist ever hired in East Africa, ever. And they made him a game warden when he, when he got the job so that he couldn't do his, his actual, uh, what he was trained for. When did, you, when did you first go to Africa? I mean, you sound very well informed. I believe what you're saying. When did you first go? What led you to go? And 22 years ago. I've been there for 22 years. Do you go every year? I live there. I just am here doing my books. Do you actually feel yourself a, as an African resident and your main residence is in well, Africa? I am a legal resident of Kenya. Yeah. And how much time each year do you spend there? Well, I haven't been there much this year. I've been doing this book. And then uh, the year before I was doing the Karen Blixen Comanche book. And then the year before that, the Crocodile book. So I guess I'm due for a break now. I'll get back. Well, you must, it must hurt you to see your, you know, your home destroyed. Well, it's not really my home. I was born in New York. It's an adopted home, and um, it, uh, it's unpleasant to see so much destruction. Yeah. You're coming back with a very, very strong message, and you're saying at the same time, you might as well just write it off 8,000 square miles, almost as though it's, it's hopeless. Is it really all so completely hopeless? Is there no hope for Africa? No, I don't think that. I, I think while there's life, there's hope, there's got to be hope. I mean, who's to say somebody might be born tomorrow who... Uh, who would be elected and believed? Who would be honest? I don't know. I mean, we can't say it's the end of honesty. It's not the end of truth. It's not the end of everything. After all, we've got a few trees in Central Park. But I'm just saying our children will never know what could have been seen in this generation. And we will never know what could have been seen by Teddy Roosevelt in his generation. And we're just losing more and more and more Nobody seems to be interested in changing the direction. That's what alarms me. And I, I, I personally would just say, dig your heels in and refuse to go farther. The march downhill has gone too far. The speed is getting greater as it goes downhill. And there's, there's too much going on at too great a rate, too much growth, too much waste, too much speed, too many things, too much. Are you able to go back in time when you go to Africa? Is there still a primitive state of, of consciousness and life there? Are you able to sort of, has growth been retarded at all in Africa? Do you find yourself getting back to any of your... Uh... If you go out uh, farther and farther and farther in Africa, you can get back into the sort of marvelous Pleistocene atmospheres. But nowadays you have to really go back. Lake Rudolph has been completely taken over by missionaries and foreign projects who are all manipulating the fish population in the lake and shooting the crocodiles and trying to prove this and that and absolutely ruining it. Uh, nowadays I'd say the Sudan. Tanzania has a few areas although it's closed. You just have to keep going more and more, uh, more and more far afield. Do you find it essential for your own sanity to get back to sort of your own Walden Pond? I mean, well, I'm not afraid of insanity in an, in an insane world. It's just uh, terribly enjoyable. I think, I think it's uh, anthropologically one of the finest hours of, of all time to watch the human species turning the corner, as it was, as it were, uh, changing from an animal that was related to certain natural laws, uh, turning the corner into a really artificial, ludicrous beast of the most outrageous characteristics, uh, inexcusably greedy and selfish and dumb and hypocritical, short-term in his thinking and silly in his goals and 
all of this coming to a head. I mean, it's always been this way, but right at this moment, it's coming to this fabulous peak. It just, it's just so terribly interesting. I mean, it's almost worth it all happening just to see it because you are no stranger to Studio 54 or this party or that party or this Fifth Avenue duplex and apartments. You get around, you're one of the official beautiful people. You count as your friends, everyone from Bianco Jagger and Mick and Andy and Jacqueline Onassis. I mean, you have a really, a very wide sweeping view. So I think we have to pay attention to what you're saying. And again, the question is, well, what can we do? What can we do? There's a lot to be done, and I would just say that it's almost the opposite of everything being done now. I would, I would say that we have to suspect everything we're told. Question every ad we read. As Toynbee says, why are you so scared of the bomb when you got Madison Avenue? It's a media world going quicker and quicker. Photography is supposed to be an art now. It's only an art because it's so quick. It's, uh... You it's yourself just, don't think photography is art. I think, I think you can photograph artistically, but I certainly don't consider it an art, no. It's not like painting or music or sculpture? Well, it's not like painting, but I mean, uh, sculpture isn't like painting either, it re really. Uh, Being but, classified as an art, I mean. I think photography is something that could be used. It's a new field which has been held up by a, an awful lot of constipated, frustrated artists. I think it has an incredible uh, future to it, but people have got to loosen up and make use of it and not take it so seriously and you know, be framing all these things. It's, it's a marvelous thing. It's as good as whatever we make out of it. But what all I was suggesting was that it's so terribly quick to do it in a sixtieth of a second or a thousandth of a second, you can get what they want to call in the gallery as a work of art. Well, I mean, you can't paint a painting in a thousandth of a second. This is uh, a good art for the speedy future. We're going so fast. There's so much happening. There's so many people. There's so many things. There's, it's sensory saturation. It's, it's, it's chaos. The, the quality, the fall off in quality, the fall off in value. There's, there's too much to uh, even remember yesterday, let alone to remember the, pa uh, the real past, the history. To learn anything from history, you have to have some kind of memory. You can't remember anything when there's so many things happening. I see that you, you seem to be striving for more of an informality in your pictures. The ripped edge of the, uh, the fabric around the pictures, the ripped, ripped out look and the black marks along the photograph. The mixing of the collages just creates sort of a more informal effect. This seems to be a very deliberate thing that you're doing. Well, I like informal things and uh, I think photography is, in a sense, <laughs> Uh, as Henry Gelzoller brilliantly pointed out during one very serious lecture on photography, he turned to the person with him and said, uh, there was this debate about whether or not it was an art. And he said, I always thought it was a hobby. Of course it's a hobby. It's enjoyable. It's something to be used. It's something to be worked with. And uh, I, I don't think it's something to be sort of worshipped. It's, it's like a paintbrush in someone's hand. I mean, if they do well with it, wonderfully. If they don't, Forget it. When did you take your first picture? Who gave you your first camera? Oh, I went out and scrounged my first camera a long time ago when I was really small. You immediately captivated with that little box and the image it captured? I mean, well, I think it's, it's totally forgotten uh, the fact that photography is a miracle. I mean, in this day and age, you can catch something forever in a, in a millionth of a second. It's, it's, it's a miracle. It's, it's a chemical, technological, incredible miracle that we've taken for granted and we've been swamped by the sheer quantity of photographs and the equipment and all the ridiculous people that sell it and manufacture it and all its ridiculousness. The Why do you do it? Why do you take pictures? Does it... What are your reasons for taking pictures? Well, I, of course... You say that you have no message, and yet, of course, there's a great profound message, not only in your pictures, but you articulate it very well. Do you take pictures to, to give this message, this message of, of doomsday? I have no messages, and I am not interested in messages, and I'm not interested in photography. I just like the subject matter, and I like, uh, I like the magic of it. It's definitely magic, and I, I just think because there are six zillion cameras, people forget that it's a magic instrument, and it does uh, things that simply... Uh, simply are miraculous. And of course, I think that film downstairs that George made was really exciting. I mean, talk about being informal and the mixing of things. I mean, your diary was a, actually a film made of the pages of your diary in which you'd done collages of, uh, 
oh, I saw Candy Darling. That was fun to see Candy back again. Yeah. And uh, Andy and Bianca and just people, natives and animals. And uh, when did you start keeping this diary? Uh, about 20 years ago. And you kept a page every single day? Yep. It's like being an addict. <laughs> and you go home at night after when you come home from the parties or, or when you, in Africa and just sort of paste it and put it together and write on it? And, yep. It's like a potage, collage, garbage heap. And in fact, I noticed that you've made posters out of them, lithographs of, of the different diaries. What do you, they're your reflection of life, your statement of what you've done. Do you hope that uh, in this way, through your collages, through your pictures, you talk about immortality? Is this you reaching out for immortality? You say you take a picture, it stays around forever. We are but specks here for a moment. Is this your way of cre creating your own immortality? Is that why you take pictures? No. I, I have no belief in life of any kind after death, I can assure you. Are you enjoying life? I mean, there's a lot of negativity to what you say, and of course there's a lot of negativity to life, and through negative people I think we could build a more positive world, but you're happy. I remember what Karen Blixen said. Blixen was Percival's safari partner. Africa amongst the continents will teach it to you that God and the devil are one. We're just sentimentalists who are living in a nursery world of hope. It's, it's marvelous that death is an end. What's the matter with that? Uh, we have plenty of time to live. We have plenty of time to have fun and really get into things. I have absolutely no fear of dying. I just couldn't imagine. It's, it's, it's one of the most natural processes there is. It just irritates me when, due to our greed and lack of consideration and our stupidity and, and politics, that other creatures have to suffer a fate that we're all in for prematurely. I just don't see the point of it and it irritates me. You've taken a lot of trouble, I think, sort of framing this exhibit, setting it up. I know you you showed it here because you wanted this, this of course you like the idea of ICP, but also it was the ambiance and the, uh, the whole idea of ICP. How, what, what is it doing for you? How is it helping you expand yourself? What has ICP done for you as a photographer? Nothing. I, I don't uh, think of it that way. It's just that uh, I think this has always been such a great place and I always wanted to um, participate in any way with anything they would ever do and uh, I think in the past it's just handled itself so terribly well and been such a really uh, quiet and low-key fabulous uh, show place of an art form that is terribly new and if there's any way of helping that's that's what I'd like to do. I love this integration of the crickets. How did you uh you decide to put the crickets in? Well, that's about all there is left down there, so why not have a few chirpings in the background? Well, I hope that everyone will turn out and come out and hear the crickets and see the pictures and uh, this kind of wide-ranging conversation, and I can't hope to uh, have you elicit all your point of view from it, but I think the book probably will do a lot better job, and I hope this will inspire people to go out and get the end of the game. I, I could say that this show actually just echoes the sort of visual side of the book. The book is a very detailed and thorough explanation of what I've tried to generalize about here. And uh, Norman Borlaug, who got the Nobel Prize for the Green, being in, inventing the Green Revolution and who is the world expert on human population dynamics, has got a very important thing to say.